Please welcome. That kind of looks like wedding. So if anyone has any concerns, please raise your hand. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so what is what the hell is serverless? You probably heard this word uh, several several times, at least because it's kind of becoming the next uh, next big thing. So uh, I, I have uh, a slide about myself as well. So uh, as I was presented, I'm a data engineer. I work, work at the Land Research Group. Uh, I mostly write in Python, and I actually did some parts of this talk uh, on uh, Russian PyCon uh, this year, uh, but there was, there was some trouble with the slides. Uh, so uh, now it's a newer and upgraded version, which is full. Uh, also, uh, we organize... Uh, so how many of you guys are actually using Python? Could you raise your hand? Nice. So we, we also have um, uh, a conference, basically a series of meetings right now uh, by a pay data brand. We are mostly in Moscow, but we are also uh, moving to St. Petersburg and uh, also uh, doing some negotiations to, to make some, some uh, pay data related talks here. So if you want to discuss it, please let me know. All right. Um, what I do and what mostly data engineers do on their work uh, is uh, dealing with pipelines, right? So uh, most of you guys probably, if you have some relation to DevOps, you already uh, saw all these titles, uh, all these tools, so you know you know what this is about. And you know, uh, so uh, depending on how heterogeneous your infrastructure is, it depends uh, how much pain you're feeling when you're supporting all that. So, uh, but uh, this actual talk uh, will include some uh, marketing words. So I'll, I'll be talking about big data in microservices because that's what I'm dealing with usually. Uh, let's take a look at uh, how we're actually dealing with uh, cloud services. Uh, so let's let's maybe take a look at Amazon. Let's take a look at Azure. Uh, or how how do we do that? So we have a cloud. Uh, usually, well, what we do, we just cut a piece from that cloud, uh, uh, just take, a, so create some virtual machine, uh, just specifically for our purposes, selecting the resources, uh, and then after that, we need to deploy stuff onto that machine. We need to monitor it. We need to do basically all the same stuff that we do anyway on our own servers, right? Uh, and uh, that's, that also means that we need to have our own guy which will be supporting it. Uh, and uh, this kind of looks to me like we're just uh, moving moving our trouble to another place, but we still have all the same questions, we still have all the same problems, so it doesn't really solve what we're trying to solve. Uh, so, uh, if a problem is in servers, so what, what we should do, we, we can go serverless. What does that mean? Uh, there is an article about that on uh, Martin Fowler's website, it's written by some guy named uh, Mike, someone, I don't remember the last name, sorry. Uh, but you can click the link uh, afterwards. So uh, there are basically two main definitions of what is the serverless. So uh, usually uh, the first definition is that uh, uh, it's something, it, it's basically the state when uh, your application is depending usually on some third party software which is running in the cloud, which is supported by some other guys, you don't need to worry about it. And uh, another, another definition is uh, uh, it's more precise, I would say, that's uh, more about some parts of your business logic, of the business logic of your application running inside uh, uh, really short-living containers uh, or somewhere in the cloud. You don't really need to, to worry about it. You just execute it, it uh, runs somewhere and gives you the result back and that's it. So, okay, uh, what do we usually need from the, from the cloud? What do we usually need from these servers? We may need some kind of API, right? We may need something to just accept queries and uh, execute some really simple magic and give us the results. Uh, you probably heard a lot of these things. Uh, Heroku is more uh, over um, hosting thing, but uh, not really like a serverless thing, but still you can also uh, use it to host uh, serverless applications. So uh, another, another typical case is uh, storage when we have also have maybe some kind of API or uh, something like this and we uh, just upload uh, our stuff there and uh, uh, we store some documents, we store some files, store some binary objects uh, and uh, we want to access them uh, afterwards. Uh, we may have some cloud of uh, small devices when where we need to uh, orchestrate it, we need to uh, upload uh, like new firmware updates there uh, uh, we may need to uh, um, 
you know, uh, launch some events, some notifications on, on devices and so on and so on. And uh, these, uh, these things also solved by several uh, third party services which are in the cloud, which you don't need to support. Uh, all, one, one more thing is uh, dealing with uh, CI CD and testing. Uh, so we have, uh, like, we have a lot of tests and we need to fully. Um, recreate our production environment, right? And uh, cloud is really uh, basically the easy thing to to use to, to do that because we just move, uh, move some sliders here and there and we have a virtual machine which is basically a replica of our, uh, no, not replica, but like a copy uh, of our production server and we just uh, run our tests on it. Uh, and uh, there are also several uh, cloud things that uh, allow you to do that, uh, and uh, also some security analysis uh, using uh, cloud power technologies and so on. Uh, and uh, one of the most famous and one of the most popular is um, running some computation tasks in the cloud, right, as well. So we, uh, on Amazon, we have, for example, Amazon uh, Elastic MapReduce, uh, which allows you to just upload your data and run uh, Hadoop or Spark jobs over it. Uh, so it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, and uh, these are just, you know, basic things, but there are a lot more and uh, you probably heard that there is another marketing word like something as a service, like platform as a service, software as a service, whatever as a service. Uh, so there are mm, uh, providers for cloud-based authentication, for a search, for uh, a video streaming. Uh, there is full-featured uh, IDE in the cloud, uh, like development environment and so on. And uh, all these applications, they don't require you to basically do anything. We don't require anything from your ops guys to do. You just click a couple of buttons and you know, it's right there. Uh, and you can actually rely on it in some, some parts of your business logic. But um, there is even a uh, cooler thing, uh, which is basically what if we just want to run some logic in the cloud and that's it. We don't uh, really need to specify that logic, uh, what that logic should do. Uh, we just want to have uh, some way to quickly execute some really small pieces of the code, maybe putting together uh, some parts of our system and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, and uh, this is what uh, is, uh, that is called, like by another marketing word, is function as a service, uh, FS. So uh, there is uh, Amazon Lambda, there is Azure Functions, there is Google Cloud Functions and so on. And um, uh, I'll, I'll mostly be talking about uh, AWS Lambda today because uh, that's one of the most uh, well developed and one of the uh, most widely used things. Uh, and we will actually make, make an example of it because uh, this presentation is basically a tutorial uh, so you, you can use uh, later slides to uh, try and build a demo of that application yourself and see if it fits to uh, what you're trying to solve. Uh, uh, so uh, there are also, uh, as with any technology, there are, you know, there is good thing, uh, there are some good things, there are some bad things uh, about using, using uh, such approaches. So uh, good things are uh, that you're basically just paying for resources you use, where you're paying for uh, time that uh, cloud servers spent uh, executing your code. Uh, but uh, the bad stuff is that, uh, as I as you probably noticed on this slide, I have a bunch of logos uh, on, on lots of my slides. So uh, the thing is you're tying yourself, you're tying your uh, business logic to some particular vendor. Uh, and uh, this means that uh, you just depend on it afterwards. And uh, this is also a decision uh, to make because uh, most engineers, they don't really want to completely depend on uh, in their infrastructure on something which is not controlled by them. And that's also completely understandable. Uh, also, uh, as, as I said, because uh, you're paying for resources you use them, uh, at some point when you, uh, your business grows, you may uh, suddenly realize that you have to pay a lot more money than if you, you just had it, some, some, some parts of your infrastructure on your own service supporting by, uh, supported by your own guys. And that's also a thing to keep in mind when you're, uh, you're going, going serverless. Okay, uh, I put together some uh, basic cases of applications that, uh, uh, that are n not really, right now, uh, it's not really uh, easy to find them like any, uh, everywhere, but uh, the, uh, there was a quite common, like not so long time ago. So let's say we have some uh, web application, we have some website, whatever, uh, which accepts queries, which dumps logs to a disk, and we have some 
ground jobs that are, uh, or we have some identify whatever thing that monitors the uh, file system events and uploads this data to S3, and we have some scheduled jobs uh, in the cloud that uh, run Hadoop over it, for example, or Spark or whatever, uh, and usually. Uh, because it's a really expensive uh, uh, time and resource expensive operation, then that means that uh, we usually get the result uh, about in about an hour. Uh, if if everything's good, we get the result in about an hour from where we actually saw these logs for the first time. Uh, and uh, but usually. Uh, in, mo in a lot of companies, they actually just run it once a day, to, for example, to train some machine learning model, right? And uh, then just reuse it in the next day. So uh, we basically have uh, like 24 hour offset on what we're trying to achieve, and that's not really a good thing. Uh, but that's, that's pretty common. Uh, so uh, and, uh, one of the things people are starting to think about in this case is uh, moving everything to like more streaming streaming fashion and they use something like uh, some data bus basically right with that can be Apache Kafka it can be a RabbitMQ or whatever some queue service uh, and uh, but th this also means that uh, Dealing with your logic, uh, you'll need to write a lot of code to uh, convert data from one format to another. Uh, then you'll need to deploy some distributed thing to maintain it, to uh, support it, and so on. And uh, uh, you also need to, to uh, basically, you, uh, as I said, you also need some more more people uh, supporting all this infrastructure because it's usually quite complex, especially if you have something like Kafka and you have lots of data. So. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, you know the thing is to me uh, this uh, streaming streaming fashion looks kind of like bash pipelines, right? We have uh, several programs which exchange data; uh, they work simultaneously, and uh, one program generates events to events to another program. So you know there is this trick uh, that minds uh, uh, mind ma makes makes us think that uh, programs are executed in a sequ in a sequence. Now you can just easily run this, and you'll see okay, and then we'll, then we'll wait for three s seconds. So it uh, they are both executed simultaneously, and uh, pipe just connects uh, the output of the first to the, with the input uh, of the second. So uh, there is another another might talk about some bash magic, but. Uh, the thing is, it's also processing data in streaming fashion. So, uh, but you know, let's take a look at uh, some kind of similar architecture to what, what I drew with uh, what I drew with uh, Nginx on uh, Amazon infrastructure, right? So we have API Gateway that accepts requests. We have Kinesis, which is basically Amazon version of uh, Apache Kafka. We have S3, which is uh, object storage. We have Redshift, which is uh, a business intelligence uh, warehouse. We have Elasticsearch. We have uh, MapReduce, which grabs our data and processes it. So it's kind of the same thing, but we also have these small pieces here that are called Lambda, right? Amazon Lambda. And to me, they kind of look a little bit similar to, maybe not to bash pipes, but to some intermediate things in bash like awk or uh, sad, you know? Uh, so why do I say that? Uh, let's, uh, you know what, let's, uh, here uh, starts the tutorial part. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you should just, you know, go, go ahead and try it right now, but uh, in Amazon, as always, you can just go to, to the web interface and create your own Lambda, right? You can just go to Amazon Lambda, select a language. I prefer Python. I write in Python for six years, so uh, Python is the best. Uh, and then uh, you see, uh, you actually see what Lambda is in this case. So Lambda, in terms of any code, basically, it's not just Python. It also supports uh, JavaScript, it supports Go, whatever. Uh, it's basically a function that accepts two arguments, uh, event and context. So event, which was generated by some application, and context is basically a constant context, right? And it does the magic and returns some, uh, some value, right? It's really easy. It's just, just an application that reacts to some event. Uh, and uh, you can go ahead and use command line AWS meanings to just run it right away uh, through uh, AWS Lambda invoke and execute it and uh, get something in return. So the output is uh, saved in the file and you uh, see it right away. Uh, and 
uh, also, uh, if you did everything correctly and you configured your Lambda function to log into CloudWatch, then you can open the CloudWatch on Amazon and see all the logs from that function that it was execu executed, how much time did it spend executing your code, and so on and so on. Uh, so, Amazon is great in this case. Uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, it's actually if you're trying to implement really, really complex infrastructure by hand, it may become really, uh, really hard. Uh, because uh, you need to not only write write the code, but you also need to uh, pack it to, to bundle it together with all all the dependencies to bind it uh, to events, uh, to uh, and to one of the hardest parts. Uh, in case of Amazon, you need to configure all the security policies to allow your functions to access uh, access things and allow uh, your uh, services you used to uh, send uh, results, uh, send events to Lambda functions, and so on and so on. So what what people usually do in this case, they just go and take some framework, right? Uh, and there, it turns out there are several frameworks for this purpose, uh, written in different languages, uh, serverless in uh, JavaScript, Chalice and Zappa are in Python, and Apex is in Go. Uh, and uh, to start, you just need to basically run init or create. Uh, I have examples for both uh, serverless and Apex. Uh, serverless by default creates, uh, you can specify the type and it creates a project for Python and Apex by default specifies it, uh, creates project for JavaScript, but you can just uh, re rename it and modify the config file. And a config file is also really simple. So for serverless, you just configure uh, the runtime that will be used in the, in the cloud to execute your code uh, and the handler that it will be calling to, uh, and also, as you, as you can see, for uh, when you're dealing with uh, API Gateway, for example, then you just specify the uh, path, uh, the URL to your application, which will just go and execute your code, and it's really simple. And the same, the same goes with, uh, goes with Apex. Uh, and the thing is, uh, um, basically, any, uh, any uh, uh, thing inside Amazon like any, ser any Amazon service, it actually has its own um, Amazon resource uh, identifier, so it's called IRN, a resource number or something, uh, and it's just uh, uh, a token that you may use to uh, attach your, your code to events to, of that, that service. Uh, and also, in, when you're executing code in Python, that uh, by default it means that uh, there is a module called uh, boot03, uh, which is Python, uh, Python bindings to mm, AWS infrastructure and it's available right there. So when writing new code, you can just import it and it will work at all times. Uh, then, uh, as I said, you need to to do several steps to actually execute your code. Uh, and I wrote some uh, really really uh, simple examples. So let's uh, go ahead and create two lambdas. Uh, one for uh, accepting the uh, things from uh, API uh, and writing them to Kinesis and one uh, getting things from Kinesis and writing them to S3 in a file. Uh, so it's re like really simple API, but it kind of, uh, you know, recreates uh, the pipeline that you might actually have in your business logic and that can be really helpful. So, as I said, there is not really a lot of code that you need to write. So I just import Vodo, I just uh, grab the client for Kinesis, uh, I just specify the name of the stream, which is basically the same as topic in Kafka. Uh, and then all I need to do is just call uh, the event. Uh, so I have a, I have an event ca came to, uh, coming to me from uh, API Gateway, and then I'll just call Kinesis client to actually put the data there and uh, do some uh, uh, error handling uh, on top of that. Uh, and uh, the second lambda is also really, really simple. So uh, I just uh, also I, I have uh, just a single function that accepts the event and the context. And uh, I go iterate over records because uh, in Kines Kinesis actually sends them over uh, in, in uh, base64 encoded way. So uh, I, I decode them, uh, load them, uh, do some magic, uh, and uh, just, uh, just run it. So. And yeah, I use the word PyCon here because uh, I, I was going to talk about this on PyCon, but I didn't, didn't have the, these slides there, so you're seeing this, this thing first. Uh, yeah, it's really simple. It's just like 20, somewhat about 20 lines of code. It's nothing. Uh, and uh, config is not also really, really large. It's kind of the same size as the code. So this is the first part of the config. You just, as I said, you specify the runtime. Uh, this is a config, uh, by the way, this is a config for the serverless uh, framework. So you specify uh, uh, the runtime. Uh, you specify the 
name of your lambda, uh, you specify the handler which will be uh, called when uh, s some event occurred, like there is some query to uh, API, uh, API gateway or there is uh, some message in Kinesis or whatever. Uh, and then, uh, uh, as I said, you uh, refer to uh, those services by, uh, by ARN. And uh, here's the second part of that config. So as I said, the, one of the hardest parts is to configure all the security politics, uh, policies around that. So uh, you need uh, to specify uh, like the proper access for, uh, for your Lambda for all the resources. So it, it has to have, uh, uh, for example, the uh, first thing has to have the right permission to write things to Kinesis. Uh, the second one uh, should have the read permission for Kinesis and uh, write permission to S3 and so on. But it's also really, really, really simple. So we just specified uh, there are managed, some managed policies and you create so, some if you want uh, by your own. Uh, really simple. It's basically the whole config that you need to uh, write in order to execute your uh, cool uh, business uh, pipeline in the cloud. Uh, which consists of several services, which solves uh, some business business case, uh, which scales really really good, and which requires you basically nothing uh, in terms of maintenance. Oh, I think it's amazing. Uh, I, I, I understand that it's not really uh, like representative because you probably can't see anything, but this is an example of the logs uh, that you might uh, get when you're actually executing things. You, you will see them later in in the slides when they're available. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, to actually execute things, you, you ju all you need to do, you, you can just send uh, the query to that API, which was created somewhere in the cloud for you. You don't know where it is. You just have uh, an ent uh, entry point to it. And the result of that thing is actually fi a JSON file with your, uh, with your uh, data that you've sent, uh, created on S3 uh, right away. So it's pretty cool. Uh, to me, it kind of looks like you probably know that there is a really amazing game called Factorio. So if, if you have uh, like several days that you want to spend on nothing to forget about your relatives and you know to just sit and play, this is an amazing thing. Uh, just you know, but uh, remember, then you, uh, if you're actually going to try it, then you'll uh, get get lost from life for several days. So Factorio. Uh, and uh, there are also, I mentioned two, two more frameworks. There is Zappo and Chalice, which are basically mm, tools for creating uh, uh, web services and web applications uh, in serverless fashion. So you just write, uh, write the code uh, like usual. Zappo is, uh, can be used to deploy, to actually deploy your uh, any uh, WSGI application. Uh, for example, Django application, you can just go ahead and uh, deploy it in the cloud and it will create uh, entry points in API gateway and it will just work. And Chalice is really, really similar to Flask. So it's basically just Flask, Flask with one more command, uh, deploy uh, things and it will just do the same. It will go and uh, upload and uh, execute things in the cloud for you. Uh, and there is also a really cool thing called Pyran which is more of a computational framework. So if you have some code which you want to execute on a uh, huge number of nodes, but this code is small and it's uh, like, you, you don't really need to uh, you know, buy a thousand of servers on Amazon to execute it. You just want to execute it, get the result, and then kill, kill anything and don't pay for, for uh, what you've created. So um, it's, called, it's called Pyran. I believe it's what's created by some guys from MIT, if I'm correct. Uh, you just import it, you just write a function, you just execute it, and that's it. So it's really simple. Uh, underneath it, it creates uh, on serverless, uh, because it's serverless, it mm, runs uh, on Amazon Lambda, it creates some containers and uh, executes some code on them, and then uh, they're killed and so on. But to you, it's really simple. Uh, so uh, there are uh, several things to remember. As I said, one of the uh, most uh, challenging things is to uh, actually pack your code together with dependencies. You know, in Python, it's really simple that you can use something like virtual end, but if your code depends on uh, things that depend on uh, system-wide libraries, right, then you will need to pack it all together with your code, and there are some uh, tutorials how to do that. But there is also this uh, really cool project. Uh, it's, it was created by maintainers of Zappa. Uh, they packed a lot of stuff for you, and you can just go ahead and uh, download it and use it. Uh, uh, also, as I mentioned, there are some limitations to what you can do with Lambda, so it's not, uh, they're not meant to, uh, uh, I, I just repeat it, uh, they're not meant to execute some really resource-consuming things. They're basically just uh, really, really pieces 
uh, really, really small pieces of your infrastructure that can replace your ETLs, that can replace your uh, event monitoring system, that can replace a lot of different things that are dealing with infrastructure. So that's why I mentioned DevOps. Uh, and you can as well take a look at uh, Amazon Docs uh, in order to, to check these limits uh, and uh, to check the pricing as well. So. Um, and uh, one more thing about testing. So, uh, the, as I mentioned, there is this Python uh, library called uh, Boto. So there is Moto, which basically the mock uh, is basically the mock for for Boto. And there is also a Docker Lambda thing that tries really hard to recreate the Amazon environment in a Docker container, and you can use it to try and uh, uh, experiment and execute your serverless applications inside it and see if it works. So yeah, that's it. That's it from me. You can. Connect, connect to me if you have any any further questions, uh, and and don't forget about PyData. I mentioned it on the first slide. So thank you. Any questions? Thanks a lot, Nikolai. Now we have some time for questions, and I think we could proceed in Russian. Итак, вопросы к Николаю у кого-нибудь? Вопросы, вопросы, вопросы. Не вижу леса рук. Коллеги, пьющие чай. Вы в очень выгодном положении. Вы можете пить чай, слушать доклады, задавать вопросы. Да, можно не только воду, наверное. Есть вопросы? Добрый день. Есть такой вопрос. Есть какая-то попытка сравнить... Понятно, что все эти решения платные в какой-то uh -huh. степени. А есть попытка сравнить косты на содержание своей инфраструктуры и перехода на серверлесс? Скорее всего, там есть пара графиков, где-то пересекающихся в одной точке. С какой-то uh -huh. момента это становится эффективно или, наоборот, неэффективно. Есть попытки просто оценить это? Тут, честно, я, я пытался гуглить. Там были какие-то зачатки исследований на эту тему. Я не нашел график, я бы его вставил в презентацию. Но у меня, у меня ощущение, что как бы... Может быть, у меня это заблуждение, но мне кажется, что это имеет смысл, когда у вас большая компания уже, которая там есть какие-то э, застарелые какая-то инфраструктура, и вам бы хотите там какие-то части этой инфраструктуры выстроить с нуля, и, возможно, в облаке, да, чтобы там на это самое не тратиться. Тогда вы можете, э, допустим, вместо, скажем, у вас есть на суппорте, там, на аутсорсе отдел э, сисадминов, который это все поддерживает, вы можете их уволить, там, ну, или перестать с ними сотрудничать, просто на Амазоне написать там несколько скриптов, которые будут делать все то же самое, там, без всяких там кронжов, без, без билд э, скриптов, которые никто не знает, как поддерживать. Вот. И ну, как бы использовать, и это, возможно, будет более кост-эффективно гораздо. Коллеги? Да, конечно. AWS, он недоступен во многих частях мира. Ну, по я насколько понимаю, на Украине, в России. Как, бы, как вы это решаете? То есть, если это доступно только для американского, скажем, европейского и азиатского рынка, это большое очень ограничение, насколько я понимаю. Ну, Спасибо. я, насколько знаю, все вот эти вот части инфраструктуры, которые я сегодня упоминал, они доступны отовсюду. То есть, ну, там можно выбрать регион какой-то, с которым вы находитесь, можно там выбрать, там, не знаю, Европу. Вот я, я экспериментировал, когда это все собирал. Я, по-моему, пробовал на, сер... на серверах, которые во Франкфурте расположены. У меня все работало из России совершенно спокойно. Там, там повышается, да, там, там есть, есть задержки, но если европейский сервер берете, вот как у нас сайты в Хэтснере, например, хостятся, да, в Германии, там, в принципе, пинг вполне нормальный, там проблем нет. Хорошо, так и здесь. Понятно. Здесь еще есть ряд стран, в частности, Россия, которые требуют э, нахождения данных пользователей э, внутри страны. Uh -huh. вот. Но понятно, в Амазоне, так как сервис не представлен внутри там, Украины, России, ну, еще там список uh -huh. достаточно длинный. Это очень сильное ограничение. Вообще вот региональная зависимость AWS, так как мы ее видим постоянно в регионах, то она очень сильно как бы подрывает. Как вы это решаете? Просто используйте ирландский, там, скажем, сервис, да, и все, там, Франкфурт. Ну, или так. Ну, у нас на самом деле как? Данные, которые мы процессим, у нас э, там есть приватные данные, мы стараемся приватные данные просто в публичное облако не загружать никогда вообще. Вот. Но э, очень большое количество данных, с которыми мы работаем, они просто в зашифрованном формате, из которого ничего толком нельзя извлечь, но который при этом, поскольку там идентификатор уникальный, да, его вполне себе можно анализировать нормально. Вот. Поэтому, в принципе, с этим, с этим проблем особых нет. Вот. Ну и плюс еще я подозреваю, что наверняка есть какие-то соглашения там, с тем же Microsoft. То есть если, ну, если не Amazon, то есть вот Azure Functions, например, да, и у них э, есть договоренность какая-то наверняка на тему того, что какой-то код запускать на серверах на своих. Вот. Ну и плюс ничего не мешает э, похожую инфраструктуру, в принципе, выстроить на своих собственных серверах или на серверах, которые внутри страны находятся, используя, скажем, тот же Kubernetes, да, про который вот прошлый доклад был. Вот. То есть Kubernetes, он во многом позволяет решать очень похожие задачи. Мы берем контейнер, запускаем в нем код, контейнер дохнет там через, через минуту там сразу и все, и оно как бы неплохо работает вполне. Сервер лес. Коллеги, еще вопросы? 
Так, спасибо огромное, Николай. Спасибо.